announcements tonight, I think all I want to do is just uh, say happy birthday to uh, Jesse Lynn and to uh, Joe Rittig and to Brother Pickens. And so uh, it's kind of an unusual way to celebrate it, and, uh, but happy birthday to each and every one of you. And then at this time, it is the special, is that correct? So uh, Brother Randy's going to play uh, the special. It's the men's trio tonight. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. And then notice this verse, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, who, uh, with, who, with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Who hath despised the day of small things? It was talking about the building of, the beginning of the building of the temple after the children of Israel returned to the promised land after their 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And of course they get started and uh, it begins kind of with a trickle. It begins, it's not much going on, uh, you know, at the beginning. And so who hath despised the day of small things? And let's pray for a word of prayer. I want to ask you, Heavenly Father, tonight to bless the message. I pray that you'll use it. I, I, uh, I want to be a blessing and an encouragement to the congregation and to the people, Lord, that have assembled in um, uh, whatever manner that they are able this evening. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will use this message and use me, Lord God, as your man. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've often thought we're ending up our Faith Promise month tonight. And I've often thought that, that the way um, Faith Promise Missions is sometimes presented, uh, it would never work in any other land than the United States, especially those third, uh, third world countries where poverty is such a, a, an issue and where people 
uh, are doing all that they can to just get enough food to survive the day that the way we oftentimes present faith promise missions just wouldn't work in those lands. And, uh, and, and that concerns me some because uh, if it, a, a biblical principle should work anywhere in the world, it wouldn't be, it shouldn't be that if, it, if it's biblical, it shouldn't be that it'll work in one place, but it won't work in another place. It ought to be that a biblical principle will work everywhere. And in the United States, we're so focused on numbers when it comes to uh, faith promise and the amount, and that's probably not wrong. In some ways, it's probably not even wrong because we have so much to give that to ask or even expect Americans to give in big ways seems like the right thing to do. Um, but what I've observed over the years of my Christian walk is that what most people think of when they think of increasing their giving for missions is either um, uh, asking God to give uh, them a raise at work or uh, asking God to give them a, a better job or uh, asking God to give provide for them a windfall. And those things really do happen in, in the United States and where, uh, where uh, money comes sometimes unexpectedly and, and, and opportunities come unexpectedly. They almost jump out at us in the, in the United States of America so that a lot of times that's what we do is we're going to give above our budget and we're just going to expect that God is going to give us this money that we promised from some place that we don't understand or, you know, some kind, but, but that we know exists because we have so many opportunities here in the United States of America. I remember hearing Warren Wiersbe once say that God had always had answered his prayers for provision by giving him work. And uh, that sounds great. And by the way, I'm all for that. Uh, you know, that is, if, if man won't work, neither should he. God, if you have a need, the way to meet, meet that need is through work. There's no question about that. But um, that whole idea that the way God has always answered my prayer for provision is by giving me work works unless you happen to live in a country where there is no work. How does God provide for faith promise missions in those places. Is it true that if you have very little that you are no longer responsible, for instance, to tithe and to give to faith promise? If you're in a place where you, where, you know, again, just barely getting by for the, for that day is, um, is, 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 is your only concern, then you're not very, then therefore you're not responsible to tithe some of what it is that you were able to get for that day. Uh, uh, is that what it means? Is, does it mean that if you're in a place where you have uh, barely enough to make it through, um, uh, make it uh, uh, ends meet on your own, then uh, you're not uh, responsible. You don't have to be a part of, of uh, giving offerings to uh, support and send missionaries around the world. Is that what it means? This year, for the first time in, in our lives, many of us have an opportunity to experience faith promise, faith promise missions. And with that in mind, I wanna remind you that it, is ne it has never been about the size of your offering, um, faith promise missions giving. It has never been about the size of your offering it has always been about the size of God's blessings. And so I want to show you tonight, go through some scripture and show you some times where God took a little and he made a lot. And, uh, and I want to show you that that's really what I believe God intends all along. I'm not giving you permission to give less than you would, than you, than you ought to give, less than what God calls you to give, less than what God burdens you to, to, to do and to give. But I am going to try to show you tonight that even if it's less than you've ever done before, God can use it and, uh, and promises to use it. And the first uh, passage I have for you tonight is in Matthew chapter 14, verses 14 through 21. And in the case of the loaves and fishes, and the Bible says, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and time is now spent. Send the multitude away that they may go into themselves and or into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down in the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside 
women and children. So I noticed some things. First thing I noticed is that there, this was a huge need. The Bible says, uh, first of all, that it was a great multitude, not just a, you know, a multitude. It says it is a great multitude. And then it defines that for us at the end of this passage by telling us it's 5,000 men beside women and children. We don't know how many women and children, but we know it was 5,000 men beside the women and the children that were there. You know, uh, if you think about it, if Jesus and his disciples had all brought, each one of them had five loaves, each one had five loaves and two fishes apiece. If they had all brought their, that much, there still wouldn't have been enough to feed um, the 5,000 men beside women and children. Five loaves and two fishes. Uh, some say, people say it was a little boy's lunch. Um, but other people I know when I was in Bible college, one of my professors said, I, said, I don't think it was a lunch. They, these, uh, these are Jewish people. I think it's a little boy who's uh, got an entrepreneurial spirit. He bought enough to sell. And, uh, but even if that was the case and it was an entrepreneur's stock and he's got, I mean, the five loaves and the two fishes is a bunch. Uh, if the loaves are 10 feet long each and if the fish are 50 pounds each, it's not enough. It's not enough. And one of our problems, I think, is that we think um, God blesses America because we give so much. It's not true. God has blessed us so we give so much. See the difference? During the first part of the Civil War, uh, the Confederacy, the Southern states. The Confederacy, Confederacy was dominating the battlefields with men like uh, Robert E. Lee and especially with Stonewall Jackson. Uh, they were just dominating the, the battlefields. Lincoln was frustrated because he couldn't find a general who was willing to fight the South. These were guys that all went to school together and uh, the generals on the North didn't, didn't have the nerve to fight the generals on the South. They, they loved those men and respected them. They just didn't have the, 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 the will to fight these men. On the other hand, there's Jeff Davis, and he's got generals like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson who were fighting for their homeland. They, they believe, they look at it and feel like they have been invaded by, a, you know, by a, or they have been uh, overrun or, uh, by an invading force and they're fighting for their land and their way of life. And so uh, they're putting all of it, in, they're all into the battlefield and, uh, and, the, and the, the North wasn't at that time. And, and, and so the, the South was winning. Well, during the, this Southern heyday, when everything was going so well, one of their well-known Baptist pastors, and I can't remember his name, I um, didn't have time this week to, to do the research and find his name and look it back up uh, this time, but I, uh, one of the well-known Baptist preachers in the South during those days preached a message and it was um, popular. The message was popular so that, that it was published in the, all of the newspapers around the South. And uh, it was uh, uh, distributed to all of the uh, soldiers, uh, you know, the Southern Confederate soldiers and all that. And in this message, this pastor declared that God had blessed this, the, them on the battlefield because the Southern Baptist, the Southern Church, Baptist, the Baptist churches in the South were so good at supporting missions. And sound like what? Uh, we talk about even with ourselves and say that God is blessing America because we are so good at supporting missionaries. And, but it didn't last very long, did it? Not in the South. You know, it doesn't matter how much we give, the need is bigger than we are. Um, I heard a missionary the other day, a, a fellow talking um, about his particular field and he said and he said uh, this starting starting statistic in his particular field that uh, less than two percent of the people in their country profess to know Jesus Christ as Savior but did you know less than two percent of the world's population professes to know Jesus Christ as Savior the need is so great if we all gave everything it wouldn't accomplish it wouldn't meet the need unless God blesses it. It never has been about how much we give. It's been about our obedience to God and then God's blessing the gift. God can use little, he can use much, it's his choice. The, 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 the point is our obedience. We grow, we benefit by the obedience and by the faith and then the world can benefit by God's blessing and using it. It's never been about uh, how much we do, the size of the gift. We couldn't ever possibly give enough to meet the needs of the entire world. We couldn't. But whatever we give is plenty 
as long as God blesses it. I noticed secondly that um, they brought what they had to Jesus. So it might not have been much, but they, they brought what they had to Jesus. And this is the great secret. It's not, again, not the size of our gifts. It's the blessing of the Lord. Could it be that the Lord will allow us to see that the true blessing in giving to faith promise is not to count how big our promise is, but to mark how much God does with it? Rather than, than amening and rejoicing at the size of the offering, by the way, and who knows, it, our offering may be as good as it was last year, as large as it was last year. I do not know, and I'm not going to discount that it might not happen. I, I do not know what's going to happen in that way, and I'm sure not. I don't want to be pessimistic sounding in that. I, I don't take this as being pessimistic that, well, this offering is going to be less, and so uh, just expect that. That's not what I am saying at all. What I am saying is, that rather than amening, amening, amening the amount of the offering of the amount of the promise, let's amen and amen and amen what God does with the promise. And then another thing I noticed is that when it was said and done, there was more left over than was given in the first place. Isn't that an interesting thing? They gave, they had this little bit to give, uh, wasn't enough, but when they gave it to Jesus, Jesus was able to meet the need and there was more left over when they were done. There was more left over when they, when they began. Some of the missionaries, um, you know, in, in the world today could be in real serious trouble because so many churches operate on, like so many people do and like even our government does where they spend everything and more than they make. I remember I wasn't very long out of high school and um, uh, I was talking to a guy, at a, actually at a rodeo arena where this guy was at, and, and, um, and I had just purchased a, uh, a new pickup. And he said, oh, you're, gonna, you're, practically, you're getting into the, into the American system. What's that? I, you know, and I, how, what do you mean? And he says, you spend a dollar more than you make. And the truth of the matter is, uh, our government spends more than it makes. Most families spend more than they make. And frankly, many, many churches spend much more than they make as well. And there are going to be a lot of missionaries who may be in potential uh, trouble because the churches that they depend upon for support uh, aren't, won't get the same amount of money. Therefore, they won't be able to support them for the same amount. It's going to be, it could be a, a major trouble. I've told you this account, I've told this account a lot of times, but I want to do it again. Back in 1990, uh, my family and I uh, made a trip down to Mexico uh, on a missions trip, went down to Mexico, and on the way back, we stopped in at a church in California to, uh, for, a, for an evening service at a church there in, in, in California. The particular evening that we were at this church, they had a, they had a church planter there preaching that night, and as the church planter got up to, to, uh, to preach before he started his message, he thanked the church for all that they had done, their financial support, and all they, they had done uh, to help him in his church plant. And, and he said, this, mission, this church planter did, said that because of them, because of this church we were visiting, that because of them, that the church planter's uh, church was almost debt free. He preached his message and uh, gave the invitation. After the invitation was over, uh, the pastor came to the pulpit and, uh, and he stopped. He said uh, to, the, to the church planner, he said, uh, um, we, didn't, we didn't give to you so that you could be almost debt free. What do you still owe money on? And the church planner said that, well, that the city had required him to pave their parking lot. And they still owed, I don't remember for sure, I would say it was $20,000 on this on the parking lot, the, the project, the pavement on the parking lot. And right there, just on this, off the cuff, at the spur of the moment, the pastor turned to the congregation and he said, can I get a motion that we pay off this man's parking pavement on the parking lot? And there was a motion, there was a second, and the thing passed and it's all done. And they just, they just gave him $20,000 without even, without even considering it. And I went up after the service, I went up to ask the pastor, how in the world could he do something like that? And what he said was, we don't commit all of our faith promise uh, every month. We save back a portion so that we can do things just like that. And, and uh, they gave to missionaries and they had over to give even more to missionaries. And I believe that that's a biblical principle, even a Christ-like principle to do something like that. By the way, um, it'd be smart if our country had learned to do that. 
to put back a little bit rather than just spending and making more money and spending our grandchildren and our grandchildren into debt. Uh, it'd be smart for God, it'd be smart if our families learned to do that, to put something back for times just like we're going through today. So there's the story of the loaves and fish. Let me give you a, another account. Uh, that's the, the, the account of the widow's mites is in Mark chapter 12. And actually you can find it in more places. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and how many um, that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites, which made a far, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For they, for all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So I noticed some things here. Number one, uh, Jesus was watching the people give. Now, um, uh, a lot of people will say things like this to me. They say, it's nobody's, nobody's business what I do or do not give to God. And, uh, you know, you might agree with that statement and you might not uh, think anyone ought to be paying attention to what you give. But I will tell you this, it is God's business and he is paying attention. Uh, I don't want to make you feel guilty. That's not the point. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. God's going to get you if you don't give. God's watching and God's going to trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to, um, to, to motivate you to give by, with the fear of the Lord. That's not at all what I'm trying to do. Uh, we're living in the New Testament age and this is the grace of giving and, and we ought to be giving willingly and we ought to be giving cheerfully. I believe all of that is true. Uh, I'm just preaching the Bible though and the Bible says that Jesus beheld how they gave. He's watching. He's watching. Jesus is watching. It's his business and he's watching. Then I notice also, not only was Jesus watching how they gave, but then after beholding, after observing, after watching, the Bible says Jesus called his disciples so that they could see how they gave. He beheld what they did and then pointed, showed it to the disciples. You know, someone, uh, it reminds me that someone has to keep count down here. <laughs> we have to keep books. We have to keep count down here. And now, we don't keep a... Um, uh, a record of your faith promise in the sense that we don't put your name on the faith promise card. So I don't know what your promise is. And to be honest with you, I don't ever look at the books anyway. Someone else does that, uh, as you know. Um, but um, we don't keep a, a, a record of your faith promise, what it is you promise to God. But we do add all of the promises up and we do keep an account of what comes in and what goes out. We keep a record of it. And, you know, it's just good stewardship to do that. And then the third thing I noticed in this passage is that um, Jesus was not impressed with the size of the offering. Uh, he was impressed rather with the sacrifice of the offering. You know, it might be that this year you can't promise as much money as you, as you have in the past. But here's something. This year you can promise a bigger sacrifice than you ever have in the past. And I have one more passage I want to show to you. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to call it the point. Of, I'm going to, the heading, I'm just going to call it God's grace in Macedonia. So let's read this passage. It starts out, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For, their to, for to their power, for to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So here's the points that I want to bring out of that. Number one, uh, they gave in a, the Bible says they gave in a time of great trial and deep poverty. And yet they, they were filled with joy and they gave liberally, or the word liberally would mean generously. It's a time in their life where there is deep, tr great trial, not just trial, great trial, and a time in their life when they are in deep, deep poverty and yet they gave um, joy, they were filled with joy in giving and they gave generously. Um, 
And did you notice this, what God says in that pattern, in verse one? He says that I want you to understand the grace of, of God bestowed upon them. God blessed them so that they could give in a time of affliction and, and poverty. Ever think about that? This pestilence right now is a blessing of God so that you right now, and this pestilence happening during our faith promise, it's an opportunity for you and me right now to give in a time of great trial and deep, maybe deeper poverty than we've ever been in. It's an opportunity to learn faith promise in a brand new way. Number, another thing I noticed in this passage is that they gave beyond their power. So they gave uh, to their power, it says, and then they went, so, you know, that's budget maybe, and then they went to their power and beyond. So I take it that they figured out what they could do, and then they did even more than they could do. And they even did that willingly. And the third thing I see is that they gave themselves. And we often say that uh, we give, here's what we'll oftentimes say is that the right order in giving is this, that you give your tithes first, then your offerings on, on top of that. And then after that is when you, you pay your bills and stuff. So you always give to God first and then, you know, believe God and give to God first and then trust that God's going to bless you to pay all your bills and meet your needs. And, but that's really only partly true. Um, the biblical order would be like this. You give yourself first, then you pay your, I'm sorry, you surrender yourself first, then you pay your tithes next, and then you give to God your offerings and then you trust God to meet your needs beyond that. So uh, I'm concluding here. I, I'm not giving you permission to give less than you've given in the past because I don't know um, your uh, personal circumstances. I, 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 I know that right now people are going through all kinds of different things and some people are working uh, just like they used to work. Some people are working more than they used to work. Uh, some people aren't working at all, and uh, some people are working uh, skeleton, um, you know, uh, you just skeleton hours and just barely getting work. So we're all in a different position through this thing. And, and so it might be that your you're not in a position where it's hurting you financially at all. So I'm, I'm not giving anyone permission to do less than you've done in the past. Uh, I don't have the authority to do that. God hasn't given me the authority to do that. But I am saying what matters this year is not that you match or better your promise from last year. What matters is that you better your sacrifice over last year. You know, regardless of what happens with our finances and re regardless of what happens in our world, we can always better our sacrifice. Doesn't matter what else, we can always better our sacrifice. It's not the size of your, your gift the missionary needs anyway. It's the size of God's blessing. And God's blessing comes from our obedience and our sacrifice.